Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. Will you join me in the call to worship? This is the day Jesus is calling you. Lord, help us to hear your call. This is a time of decision. Lord, help us be strong and faithful. Come, let us celebrate God's love. Let us rejoice in the call of our Savior. Teach us your ways, O Lord. Help, Help us, us to be closer to you. you. Let us join together in joyful, joyful, we adore thee. <laughs>
Let us pray. We come before you, Creator and Savior God, knowing that we are not our own, but have been bought with a price. Our times are in your hands. Our homes and fields, our bank accounts and businesses are on loan from you. Our talents and abilities have been designed by you. Our very lives have their origin in your creative power. We come, therefore, in humility, asking only that you will help us to be happily accountable to you, our God. Amen. Let us share our joys and concerns. I want to thank you all on behalf of Peggy for all the well wishes and prayers. Uh, she's healing well. Hopes to be back with us next week here. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. We are so, so thankful that Peggy is doing much better. Good morning. I'm going to move just a little bit because I taught for years and visual aids are important. Some of you may be wondering what this uh, stuff is up here. Uh, we, have, uh, we have diapers, uh, paper towels, Kleenex, laundry detergent, and unmentionable other paper products. Uh, at administrative board, it was mentioned that the food pantry is very, very low in paper products. Uh, the school will be having a food drive soon, but few paper products come in. And People who are in food stamps cannot use food stamps uh, for this kind of thing. So we are encouraging all of you, uh, bring some paper products to go to the food bank. Uh, next Sunday would be great. I suppose we'd take it the next Sunday or two, wouldn't we? Uh, so we'd really appreciate it. And these are the, the things that they had said are most in need. Diapers, laundry detergent, and just miscellaneous paper products. Thank you, Kathy. A way for us to help the community. My name is birthday is coming up this Friday. Your grandma's birthday, right? Peggy's going to have a birthday. Thank you for telling that. <laughs> Happy birthday to Peggy. And while we're on birthdays, I know. We have a few others, and some are able to be here this morning, and some aren't. Rayanne, are you, where are you at? Oh, over there you are. It's looking on the wrong side. Rayanne has a birthday on the 24th. Oh, tomorrow, right? Yes, happy birthday. And, we're, and Sue has a birthday, too. We have a lot of birthdays, and Sue's birthday is on the 27th. Is that right, Sue? Yes, okay, happy birthday to Sue, too. Any other birthdays this week? Anybody that we didn't say that you'd like to raise your hand and let us celebrate? Jose had a birthday. Jose had a birthday? Did you like a couple weeks ago or a week ago or something? Yes, this last Wednesday. Well, happy birthday, Jose. Last Wednesday. Yay. Thank you for telling us. Okay. Um, I do just have, if you still have joys and concerns, I do want to have you keep Bob Calhoun in your prayers. He is in the hospital um, in Council Bluffs, so if you would keep Bob in your prayers. I know many of you know Bob. Um. Oh, yes. I have multiple joys this morning. Um, a couple weeks ago, Sheila and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. And Congratulations. I don't know how she stayed with me that long. Of course, she's not here. <laughs> I believe Dave and Tammy Forrester have an anniversary today, 29 years, yeah. oh. and I'm a grandpa again, oh. a grandson Thursday, Gabriel Jakes, weighed 9 pounds, 13 ounces. Congratulations, congratulations on your anniversary. Well, a real good joy to this morning is, I think a lot of you remember Mark Moore. Uh, on Facebook this morning. He's a proud uh, father of a little boy. So congratulations to him and his wife. Thank you for sharing that with us this morning.
Any other joys or concerns this morning? Uh, I think we should have prayers for Mary Lou Colvin. She had surgery this week, too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. We'll keep Mary in our prayers. My dad's surgery on Thursday went fine. Good. We're glad to hear that. He's recovering nicely at home. Thank you for sharing that with us, Emma. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Let us have a time of silent prayer. Dear gracious God, we come today to worship you and be filled with your spirit. Help us this day to see the possibilities before us with you as our guide and our strength. Show us the way. Lighten our burdens and increase our faith. Lead us to those who need to hear your message of love and forgiveness. Thank you for the blessings you have given to us in the past, in the present, and the blessings we will receive from your hand this day. We do thank you for, for birthdays, God, and, and new babies and anniversaries and all those special times in our life, God. We thank you for those blessings. Forgive us for not loving you and others of, as you have called us to do, God. Help us to do your will, to always place what you want first in our lives, God. Today we want to lift up to you those who need your healing touch in different ways in their lives, God. We pray, pray for Larry. Jean, Marie, Nancy, Bob, Mary Lou, Jesse, Rita, Sean, Sandy, Dolores, Peggy, Jackie, Dwayne. We continue to pray for our farmers for a safe harvest. Pray for our military personnel for a safe return home, God. Pray for those folks in the nursing home that they feel your peace and love with them. Remember all who have lost loved ones. And again, God, remember all those people in our country and around the world that are affected by all sorts of different natural disasters that occur in their, their place where they live, God. We lift all these people up to you, God. Um, help us to continue to pray for them every day, God. We lift all these things up and pray in your Son's name. Amen. Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. will bless us with their music.
Thank you. What a beautiful hymn with a beautiful message for us this morning. Would the children please come up this morning? Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm glad to see you this morning. I have a, a storybook, and I'm just going to read you a few pages of it so you kind of know what I'm talking about. Would that be okay? It's called Larry Lights the Way. Yes, it's a Veggie Tale video. I mean, video, Veggie Tale book, so you know Veggie Tales, right? Well, it starts out and talks about this king. His name was King Nezer. And he had a very special talent, something that he could do really well that God gave to him. And you know what it was? It was using a pogo stick, right? He was really good at it. And he jumped over some water um, before his castle, like a moat that was around his castle. He used it to jump over that. And he taught other people how to use it. He just had fun using that gift that God gave to him. Well, a man was traveling through town and he sold things and he convinced the king, that he shouldn't be using a pogo stick, he should be using a unicycle. He said, that's what you really should be using. So you know what? He put his pogo stick away, put it back in the closet, and he used that unicycle. But you know what? He wasn't good at using a unicycle. Did you see it happened? He fell in the water, right? Yeah, he wasn't good because that's not what he was gifted at. That's not the gift God gave him. But he kept trying and trying. And you know what? He got kind of sad and he got kind of grumpy. Did you ever get grumpy? He got grumpy because he was trying to do something that really he wasn't any good at. And as he got grumpy, the people in the town got grumpy that he lived. The people that he was king over, they all started getting grumpy. Except this Larry, he lighted lamps at nighttime, lighted the lamps. And that's what God gave him to do. He was good at doing that, and he kept doing what he was good at. So he stayed kind of happy, but the rest of them just weren't very happy at all. So you know what he said? He went and talked to a friend, and he said, why is everybody unhappy? And he said, you know what? I think it's because God gives everybody something good that they can do. And if you're not doing what God gave you, then you can get grumpy or unhappy. Does that make sense? God gave all of us something good that we're, at, that we're good at. And if we're not doing it, it can make us kind of unhappy. So the prince kind of took over for the king for a while because he wasn't feeling well. And he told all the people that he wanted them to figure out a riddle. I'm going to tell you what the riddle is. God made you special, like he made all of you. He loves you a lot, like he loves all of you. So what should you do with the talents you've got? So they had to figure that out. What should they do with the talents that God gave them? You know what? Use them, that's right. And they hadn't even been using them. So Larry started talking to him, and he gave him some good ideas. He reminded, I bet you know this lady's name, Madam Blueberry, right? She was a good singer, so he said, why don't you use your talent to sing? I bet you'd be happier if you started singing for people because you're so good at it. So she did. And then he talked to a man that was good at building. And he said, I think you could build something for our town that we need to share with other people. He goes, I think I could. So he started building. And everybody Larry talked to, they all had some special gift, some ability, something they could do well that God gave them. And they started using them. And you know what happened? The people started getting happier. And they started feeling good because they were sharing what God had given them, their special talents, what they were good at with each other. And eventually they talked the king into getting rid of that unicycle and going back to his what? Pogo stick, because that's what made him happy and that's what he was good at and he taught everybody else how to use one. So you know what? That story, even though it's a storybook, that same kind of lessons in the Bible, and God says the same thing to us. He says, each one of you have something special that you can do, and you may not know that yet because you're kind of young, but as you grow, you'll learn what that is, and if you use that to help other people, that's when you'll be the happiest. Does that make sense? Yeah, people in here got, got kind of sad and kind of grumpy, too, because they weren't using those gifts that God had given them to make other people happy, too. You are very good listeners. Should we have a prayer? Could you pray after me? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to use our talents 
and abilities that you have given us to help others. Amen. Well, thank you for coming up today. Good to see you. You know what? Do you want to stay up here, Jennifer? Do you want to stay up here? I'm going to give you your Bible now. Okay, I'll just have you. Oh, sorry, honey. We have a special treat today. Jennifer wasn't able to be here when we gave our Bibles on the Sunday, third graders, so we have a Bible for her. So I'm going to get it, and she's, she'll wait here while I go get it. And up on the screen, we have a prayer that we're going to pray for you, Jennifer, okay? I'll go get your Bible for you. Okay, would you join me in praying our prayer for Jennifer this morning? We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this Holy Bible. In your home, in your church, school classes, and in our worship, we will learn together and grow in our love for God's Word. Amen. Hey, there is your Bible, Jennifer. Congratulations. Thank you for coming up. Okay, you're welcome. I didn't mention it earlier, but I'm sure Marty's sons will want to tell you next week. It's his birthday this week as well. So he's at a birthday party today down in St. Joe after Sunday school they took off. So... At 9 o'clock, I got the call to fill in for him. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Psalms 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow evil men's advice, who do not hang around with sinners, scoffing at the things of God. But they delight in doing everything God wants them to, and day and night are always meditating on his laws and thinking about ways to follow him more closely. They are like trees along a river bank, bearing luscious fruit each season without fail. Their leaves shall nev- never wither, and all they do shall prosper. But for sinners, what a different story. They blow away like chaff before the wind. They are not safe on judgment day. They shall not stand among the godly. For the Lord watches over all the plans and paths of godly men but the paths of the godless lead to doom.
I also want to thank Calvin for sharing his God-given talent with us. What an example, right, of sharing your God-given abilities with us. Thank you very much. If you would stand now, as you're able, I'm going to share the gospel lesson with you from the Gospel of Mark this morning. Chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Jesus and his disciples left that place and went on through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where he was because he was teaching his disciples. The Son of Man will be handed over to those who will kill him. Three days later, however, he will rise to life. But they did not understand what this teaching meant, and they were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum, and, all, and after going indoors, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you arguing about on the road? But they would not answer him, because on the road they had been arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve disciples, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must place himself last of all and be the servant of all. Then he took a child and had him stand in front of them. He put his arms around him and said to them, Whoever welcomes in my name one of these children welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also the one who sent me. This is God's good news. While we are standing, let us join in singing, O Master, let me walk with thee, and it's on 430 if you're using your hymnal. This summer, I can't remember exactly when it was this summer, but a couple from my former parish came to worship with us here at the Oakland United Methodist Church. Following the worship service, we went out to lunch together, and then they came to the parsonage so we could visit a little longer. While we visited the couple, I remember them remarking on, on the amount of volunteers we had. They were very impressed when they came in the door um, about how many volunteers they saw within the church working that morning. You know, and I didn't really think much about it at the time. I remember agreeing with them. I, I said something like, yes, we have a lot of good volunteers. The people here are very willing to serve. But this past week, as I prepared my message for today, I remembered what this couple had told me about our many volunteers. So I tried to see things from their perspective. So thinking back, when this couple walked 
in the front door of the church, they would have immediately seen two people handing out bulletins right at the main entryway. And then when they broadened their view, they would have saw at least a couple more handing them out on one of the side doors. As they walked through the doorway into the sanctuary then, if they had looked to their left, they would have saw you know, three people running the sound system, board, screen. Um, and when they sat down and were reading through the bulletin, waiting for the service to start, they would have read that we have a nursery helper available during the worship service. Shortly before the service began, they would have saw one or two candle lighters um, lighting our candles for us. And as soon as the service started, they would have noticed at least three people leading the praise songs. And when it was time to lead the congregation in the call to worship, they would have saw a volunteer doing that as well. Uh, following worship, they would have been greeted by at least two people doing koinonia. And um, they did come to my office while I did a few things, and they waited in my office, so they saw our financial secretary um, working. So you probably haven't been counting the volunteers because I've been going through them pretty quickly, but that number comes to 17 already, okay? Um, no wonder they were impressed, right? That's a lot of volunteers just on a Sunday morning for worship. And, and just think if they had come at a different time of the year other than summer, they would have seen even more volunteers at work. On a Sunday morning during the Sunday school year, we have at least eight people helping with the Sunday school program, choir director and 10 or more choir members. Now we're up to 36, right? So like on a morning like this, if they had come, they would have, if they'd gone downstairs and looked around, they would have seen probably 36 volunteers. If it's a communion Sunday, we can add four more of that total. So now we're up to 40. That's a lot of volunteers. And think about that. That's only one morning of the week. Um, every Sunday, we have two volunteers in the evening for our Hispanic service. During the week, we have a volunteer who keeps our web page current. Um, we have three regular volunteers working with the youth every Wednesday, and someone organizing the meals, and two or three more volunteers preparing and serving. Um, we have five people once a month doing the newsletter. Uh, we have somebody doing the bulletin board. We had a nominations meeting. It was Monday evening, and so when I was doing my sermon, I counted through all the positions, you know, on our board um, that we have, all the, the chairs and people that serve on various committees. It came to 58, so there's 58 positions to fill on that. And of course, um, I'm not even counting because it's too many numbers. I would know all the people that prepare food and bring it and help serve at the luncheons. We have various luncheons and clean up and organizing all of that. We have a prayer chain, 14 people are on that. We also have at least five people who visit our, our members in the nursing homes on a regular basis. They're like on a nursing home visitation team. And I know there are more, because when I was reading my sermon, I, I would reread it. I'd add more, because I'd think of more volunteers. And so I know there are some that I haven't even included, and I apologize for that. Um, there are just so many. And then there are those that we have a special project, and you make a phone call, you know, people will step up and say, well, you know, I can help with that special project. And then there are those people who work behind the scenes, so to speak. I don't know who they are, and I don't always know what they do. I only know that they are working outside or inside the church and something needs to be done. Uh, these volunteers remind me of the shoemaker and the elves. Any of you remember nursery rhymes or, or little kid's story? You know, this shoemaker would lay out the materials and he'd come in the morning and the shoes were all made. You know, that's what it seems like to me when I come to church sometime, work that needed to be done, it's just done. I don't know who did it, I don't know when they did it, but it just got done. Um, when Methodists join a United Methodist Church, they make promises to participate in the ministries of the church by their prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness. Uh, last Sunday I talked about gifts, and today I wanted to talk about service. Yet it seems to me after all I just shared with you about the many ways you serve the church, if I preached a sermon on serving, it would be like preaching to the choir, right? You have heard that saying, right? Preaching to the choir. Well, you know, I went online because I sometimes we um, sayings like that. Maybe we don't um, interpret them exactly what they are meant. So I just wanted to say, see what it said online for the definition of preaching to to the choir. Uh, the answer I'm going to share with you was the one chosen as the best answer to the question: What does the phrase "preaching to the choir" mean? So this is the answer: It means telling something to someone who already knows it and believes it. The members of the choir are already members of the church, usually pretty dedicated ones, and so preaching to them is rather unnecessary. They sit there long enough, they get to know all the minister's sermons anyway. My mother was in the choir for many years and was also a Sunday school teacher. She could give the sermons herself when the minister was sick. 
So now we all know what I meant when I used the phrase preaching to the choir, and now I know where I can get a sub to fill the pulpit when I can't be here. So choir, you're on board. One of the things I am always concerned about in the church is volunteer burnout. Volunteers, especially church volunteers, do a lot of work with very little recognition. So in a way, church volunteers are an example of the kind of servant Jesus was speaking about in our gospel lesson for today when he said, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. That is what church volunteers do. While there, are, there may be some people outside of the church who know you serve the church, the fact is your service is not something that will be talked about at parties or written about in the newspapers. You probably will never get a medal or a trophy or even a ribbon for what you do. It is highly unlikely that anyone will write a book about you. Your name will not go down in history as being a servant of God. It is quite possible that you will never get the recognition you deserve for all you do this side of heaven. As some of you are familiar with um, Johnny Erickson Tata, a, a young woman who was paralyzed from a diving accident when she was a, a very young woman. Um, she has a book called Heaven, Your Real Home, and this is what she writes about about that, about service, and I want to share it with you because I really enjoy her words. Once after a speaking engagement, a woman came up to me to tell me how much she enjoyed my message. In her enthusiasm, she exclaimed, you're so wonderful, I wish I could be like you. You'll get a great reward in heaven. I appreciated her praise, but I see it differently. God is by no means impressed that I can paint with my mouth, have written books, traveled all over the world, or am on speaking terms with Billy Graham. When he sees my name on a bestsellers list, he doesn't get all, um, all impressed, impressed and say, boy, am I proud of her. Chalk another one up to the lady in the wheelchair. I'm not discounting my painting or books or the exciting places I've served. I just feel that I've received a lot of my reward here on earth. I've enjoyed the reward of seeing the gospel go forth because of the wheelchair and of watching believers become encouraged and inspired. It is sheer ecstasy to watch him work through my life, and I'm humbled and honored. It's just when it comes to heaven, I'm convinced the highest praises will go and should go to godly people who have labored loyally yet received no recognition. That's for our church volunteers. What I want to assure you today is your service in the church does make a difference. Serving is an act of love. Love is what we are called to do, and love certainly can change the world. The scriptures teach us that all believers are given gifts to be used for the building up of the church, and that all gifts are important. As the children's book, Larry um, Lights the Way, pointed out, um, when we don't use our God-given gifts in the church, and, and we all have them, God has promised that, then sometimes it can make our service in the church less than joyful to be honest. If we're, if we're asked to serve in a place where we don't have the gifts that God's given to us, it can, can make us not so happy. It can even make us grumpy, like um, in the book, if we're serving in ways that we are not gifted for. And I know that um, as a fact. Uh, years ago, I had a position where um, I was called to do lots of things, but most of them weren't the gifts that God had given to me. And I did get grumpy. I got grouchy. You can ask Jerry. I'm sure he, he will remember that time in our life when I was not real happy because I wasn't able to use the gifts that God had given to me. So I know that makes a difference. So um, I encourage you, if you don't know what your God-given gifts are, if you're concerned, or if, if the way you are serving in the church isn't bringing you joy, you don't feel fulfilled by it, you know, maybe it's because you're not using the gift that God has given to you. And um, I do have those inventory sheets. They're called spiritual gift inventory questions in the entryway if you're ever interested in, in looking at that. I do want to say um, that since coming here, I personally have benefited from and been very blessed by your service. I, I just want to share a little story with you, and I would share stories from this congregation, but I don't want to just pick out one person because you've blessed me in, in so many different ways and lots of people. Um, but sometimes people get the idea what they do in the church is not as important as what someone else does. The truth is it all matters. At my former parish, we had an after-school ministry uh, for pre-K through sixth grade, and, and I was in charge of uh, planning all the lessons and getting them ready, which sometimes could be quite time-consuming. I had uh, 
it was a, a board game and there were a lot of pieces and I had to cut them out and a woman that volunteered to help with me noticed what I was going to do and she said, I'll just do that for you. I'll take it home. And to me, that was just a huge relief. It made a big difference um, in my time for the week that she did that. And then a gentleman saw what she was doing and he said, you know, you should really laminate those pieces so they last longer. And he goes, I've got a laminator at home. I'll just take them home and laminate them. And, you know, um, it made a huge difference to me. It wasn't just the fact that they were making my life a little less busy that week, but it was the fact that they cared enough about the children's ministry to offer their help that was so encouraging to me. So the reason I share that is, it, it, you know, sometimes we think the little things we do don't matter, but they do. It all makes a difference, all of it. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, says it this way, in a kind of a better way than I can say it. There is no small service to God. It all matters. Likewise, there are no insignificant ministries in the church. Some are visible and some are behind the scenes, but all are valuable. Smaller hidden ministries often make the biggest difference. In my home, the most important light is not the large chandelier in our dining room, but the little night light that keeps me from stubbing my toe when I get up at night. There is no correlation between size and significance. Every ministry matters because we are all dependent on each other to function. I also want to remind you that whenever you serve others, in reality, you are serving God. And that is really who we are serving whenever we serve. You are doing what God asks his followers to do. In fact, what he created us for. This is what Ephesians 2.10 says. And in our union with Jesus Christ, he has created us for a life of good deeds. That's what he's created us for, a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. That's those God-given gifts. He's already given us what we need to do those good deeds. And as Bernie read from Psalm 1, Happy are those who delight in the law of the Lord. You are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. When we do what God has asked us to, like serving, it does make the difference. And just a reminder, too, if you haven't figured this out, this is like an encouragement service, a sermon. Because you serve, I don't have to talk about telling you to serve, but I just want to encourage you and let you know um, how much you are appreciated in everything you do. Um, I want to remind you again that you are never alone. God is always with you, helping you do whatever he has called you to do. That truth is especially helpful if God should call you to serve in a new way. You know, sometimes God asks us to step out of our box, so to speak, and try something new. Um, discover maybe a God-given talent that maybe you didn't even know you had. Maybe you hadn't even used it yet. So God's kind of calling you to step out of your box and try something new so you can discover this gift that he's given to you that you haven't had an opportunity to use. Um, briefly, there was a man in a former congregation. He had just joined the church. Um, before that, he served as an usher, which he was okay with doing. But he also attended the adult Sunday school class, and, and sometimes somebody said, you know, we need somebody to teach it. Could you lead it? And, you know, that was just something he was not happy about doing, didn't want to do. In fact, he came to our afternoon Bible study that we had during the week, and he said, guess what? He said, I'm in a real mess. And we all didn't know what he was talking about. He said, I've said I would teach the Sunday school class on Sunday morning. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know the Bible that well. I've never done anything like this. And we all encouraged him, said he could do it. We told him that God would help him. And, you know, he did. And he did a wonderful job. And, in fact, usually every month they change leaders. They just asked him to stay on. And so it kind of got to be a permanent position for him. And he was just um, like a new man. It was just a joy to watch him grow in his faith as he um, stepped out in this way that God had called him to do. We are all in ministry together. As we serve together in whatever capacity, we are helping to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. All we do helps to do that. Be assured that what you do does make a difference in this life and in the life to come. In ending, I want to share with you just a, a little reading that I found. It, it just shows how even a small act of service done in love can make the difference in someone's life. A little boy wanted to meet God. He knew it was a long trip to where God lived, so he packed a suitcase with Twinkies and root beer. He started his journey. When he got about three blocks, he saw an elderly man sitting on a bench, and he was feeding some pigeons. So the boy sat down next to him and opened his suitcase. He was about to take a drink from his root beer when he noticed that the man looked hungry, so he offered him his Twinkie. The man accepted and smiled at this boy. His smile was so pleasant that the boy wanted to see it again, so he pulled out a root beer. He said, how about a root beer? And the man said, sure, and he had this beautiful smile again. 
So they sat there all afternoon together, but they didn't even say a word to one another. It started to get dark, and the boy realized he needed to get home. But before um, he left, um, he turned around, and he'd gone a few steps. He walked back to the man and gave him a big hug, and of course the man gave him the biggest smile ever then. When the boy opened the door to his own house a short time later, his mother said, well, where have you been? He goes, and you look so happy. What's that joy on your face all about? And he replied, I had lunch with God. But before his mother could respond, he added, you know what? God's got the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the elderly man, also radiant with joy, returned to his home. His son was stunned by the look of peace on his face, and he said, Dad, what did you do today that made you so happy? He replied, I ate Twinkies in the park with God. However, before his son responded, he added, you know, he's much younger than I expected. <laughs> Too often we underestimate the powers of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a greeting, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. People come into our lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. Share your God-given gifts with them. You will all be blessed. And all God's children said, Amen. Would the ushers please come forward to take our offering this morning. Let us pray. God of salvation, help us to trust in you and help us to be faithful disciples who recognize that everything we have is a gift from you. Inspire us to share our resources as a response to your asking and as a response to your unconditional love. Amen. Let us join in singing Lead On, O King Eternal, on 580, if you're using the hymnal.
thank you for joining us for worship, and we ask that you stay for a time of fellowship following worship. Go in peace. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you for always. Amen. Oh, <laughs>